Good evening. My name is Londia McCafferty. I'm a district judge in New Hampshire. And can you hear me back there? All right. Uh, let me see if I can talk a little louder. Um, in the spirit of recent town meetings I've seen on television. Um, on behalf of Constitutionally Speaking and the New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, I welcome all of you uh, to this year's William W. Treat Lecture. Immediately following the lecture, we are going to have a question and answer session. It will be moderated by Professor John Graby from the UNH School of Law. And John has a microphone. And we're going to try to use the microphone to try to help make questions audible. Um, can you hear me in the back? OK. <laughs> Now, before I uh, introduce Mr. Buddha Toki, who will then introduce our speaker, Eric Liu, I want to recognize Ms. Joey Strobel, a trustee of the William Treat Foundation, who is here tonight. The late William W. Treat, for whom this lecture is named, established the Treat Foundation to support events such as this one. And we are very glad that Ms. Strobel is here tonight. And I'm going to take an opportunity to say just a few words about William Treat for those who may not know of him. Um, now, for those in my profession, uh, William Treat is perhaps best known for his career as a New Hampshire probate judge. But he was also a successful banker, um, politician, and diplomat. His accomplishments were not limited to the state of New Hampshire. He was dedicated to the cause of international human rights. And later in his life, indeed in the twilight of his life, at age 69, when most of us would be thinking about retirement, uh, Judge Treat served on a United Nations commission dedicated to fighting discrimination and protecting the rights of minorities. A few years later, at age 71, the United Nations asked him to lead an investigation and conduct a study on uh, standards for international fair trials. About five years after that, um, and shortly before his death, uh, his report and study was indeed approved and published. Um, by the Human Rights Commission. So it is with Judge Treat's background in human rights and diplomacy in mind that I introduce Siraj Budatoki to you. Mr. Budatoki was born in Bhutan. At age nine, his family fled Bhutan when the country's government engaged in a campaign of ethnic cleansing. He lived for the next 17 years in a refugee camp in Nepal. In 2009, at the age of 28, Mr. Budatoki came from Nepal to Manchester, New Hampshire, as part of a refugee resettlement program. Five years later, he had purchased a home for himself, his wife, his two kids, and he had obtained a degree from Southern New Hampshire University. Mr. Budatoki has not forgotten where he came from. He is the founding member of the International Campaign for Human Rights in Bhutan, and he has worked for the cause of the Bhutanese people in our state of New Hampshire. In 2014, Mr. Budatoki realized his dream of becoming a United States citizen and was naturalized. It is my privilege to inter introduce Siraj Budatoki. Thank you, Judge, for a kind introduction. Um, let me do my job now. 
as myself being one of the fortunate new Americans to attend this intellectually diverse forum. It is a great privilege for me to introduce Mr. Eric Liu as the keynote speaker. Today, we all will get an opportunity to hear Mr. Liu talks on various parameters of citizens' empowerment and beyond. Eric Liu is the founder and CEO of Citizen University, which promotes and teaches the art of powerful citizenship through a portfolio of national programs. And the executive director of the Aspen Institute Citizenship and American Identity Program. He's a writer. His books include the national bestsellers, The Guardians of Democracy, and The True Patriot, co-authored with Nick Hanor. Eric's most recent book is You Are More Powerful Than You Think, A Citizen's Guide to Making Change Happen. That was written in 2017. His book, his other books, include a China man, China man's chance, one family's journey, and a Chinese American dream. Guiding lights, how to mentor, and find life's purpose. The official book of National Mentoring Month and Imagination First, co-authored with Scott Knopp, Brandon of the Lincoln Center Institute, which explores ways to unlock imagination in education, po politics, business, and the arts. Eric served as a White House speechwriter for President Bill Clinton, and later as the President's deputy domestic policy advisor. After the White House, he was an executive at the digital media company Real Networks. In 2002, he was named one of the World Economic Forum's Global Leaders of Tomorrow. And in 2010, he was awarded the Bill Grace Leadership Legacy Award by the Center for Ethical Leadership. As myself, a new citizen, I would not agree more in his approach to flourishing civic education as a medium of citizens' empowerment. So I would like to invite my respected audience to join me to welcome Mr. Lu on the stage. Thank you. Let's please give another hand to uh, Siraj Budatoki for um, exemplifying what it is that I'm actually going to be talking about tonight, which is citizen power and showing up for community. <clears throat> also, I'd like to thank uh, Judge McCafferty. And uh, unlike her, I'm not in a position to project, because as you can tell, my voice is partially shot. Uh, so I am going to rely on this microphone, and I hope uh, um, if you have uh, difficulty hearing me, um, let's all just be quiet, because uh, it ain't getting louder. <laughs> um, I am so grateful to, uh, this morning, um, Judge McCafferty and I uh, spent some hours together at the uh, Warren Rudman uh, United States uh, Courthouse um, in Concord, and um, I got to witness a naturalization ceremony uh, in which 84 immigrants from 37 countries uh, became citizens of the United States. Uh, and then afterwards, got to spend uh, an hour or so with a group of eighth graders uh, from Concord Area Schools, uh, or uh, yeah, I think it, it Concord Area Schools, um, in which we talked about the content of our citizenship. We talked about what it was that they had just witnessed in the naturalization ceremony. And we talked about some of the um, reasons why we do that as a ceremony. 
uh, as I said to the students, we could have just, you know, the test could have just been on, done online and the certificate could have been sent in the mail. Uh, why, why'd, they, why'd they make a ceremony? Uh, and they said, well, people wanted to see each other. They wanted to kind of be recognized. And I said, okay, well, we could have done that at Arby's, right? Why, why are we doing it here at the United States Courthouse? Uh, and the answer, which <clears throat> the students uh, came to, of course, uh, uh, was that because this is a moment in which, not only symbolically, but I believe in earnest, we, the people of the United States, were welcoming to the body these new members of the body. And it was such a moving thing, not only to have been there in the morning, um, but have also, to also have gotten a chance to spend time with these young people as they were connecting the dots and realizing why it is that uh, things like this that may seem just to be uh, official processes that adults made up um, matter. Um, I also want to, um, before I begin, um, say a couple of other words of uh, thanks. Uh, I want to thank uh, Justice Souter uh, for being with us this evening. It's really an honor. Um, I, I'm tickled uh, and uh, I added to his already um, groaningly overstuffed bookshelves uh, by giving him a copy of my most recent book. And, uh, um, and I'm honored that he didn't say, no, keep it, I got too many. So <clears throat> thank you, Justice. Um, last but not least, I really want to thank um, all the people um, who are both part of the <clears throat> New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, um, the New Hampshire Humanities uh, Council, um, the Constitutionally Speaking Program, and all of the partners um, who have brought all of you here tonight. Um, it's Friday night. Don't you all have something better to do than this, you know? <laughs> this is great that we filled the house here uh, on our Friday night uh, for a conversation, and it is so uh, meaningful, and I frankly um, uh, think it's perhaps testament to what I'll have to talk about topically, because it is timely, uh, but it's also testament to the culture of this state and the ways in which uh, uh, a place like New Hampshire uh, that takes quite seriously the idea of self-government um, and takes quite seriously the idea of showing up, that you don't just mail it in, that you don't just comment online, but you see each other face to face and you make that extra little effort to show up even on a Friday night that's drizzly when you could be home cozy right now, um, to show up and be in the company of others. And so grateful to all the institutions that brought us here uh, today. And I'm really just excited and proud uh, to be in the state of New Hampshire. Um, as I will say in my remarks uh, later on, uh, the slogan, live free or die, um, I think uh, often uh, gets lumped into uh, the category of sl state slogans like, you know, don't mess with Texas. Um, that's just supposed to be kind of a, a statement of attitude, right? Um, and in, on some level, of course, it does reflect uh, a fiercely independent, uh, liberty-focused attitude in this state. Uh, but I will tell you, as somebody who grew up outside of Poughkeepsie, New York, in the Hudson Valley, who lives now in Seattle, Washington, uh, and therefore has always observed New Hampshire at a distance, at a remove, not as a, as a resident here, uh, that I admire any place whose civic culture takes seriously the idea of live free or die. Uh, and as I'll say uh, over the course of my remarks here, um, I think we, we live in a moment right now where we're, go we're all getting to, whether, whether or not we wanted to, we're getting to unpack the meaning of what it is to live free. So <clears throat> with that, um, let me just uh, uh, say uh, a word about our moment. We are gathered together here uh, at an extraordinary time. And I think everybody knows that, and that's a big part of the reason why um, you've made the special effort to show up tonight. Uh, and that moment is not just the first 90-some days of this uh, president's administration and the uh, incredible surge, indeed the nearly unprecedented surge of civic engagement and activity um, that uh, he alone has sparked uh, in the American populace. Um, it is also a measure of what has unfolded over the last many years. We've been living over the last at least half decade to a decade in a period of what I think is one of the greatest periods of bottom-up citizen power uh, in this country's recent history. And indeed, it's not just limited to the borders of the United States, all around the world. Movements that run the gamut from the Arab Spring to the Maidan Revolution, to the Orange Revolution, to the Umbrella Revolution, and then of course here in the United States, Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party, Black Lives Matter, $15 now, the Dreamers, the Trump Train, the Bernie Sanders Movement, 
all of these may seem very disparate. They may seem very disconnected from one another. And you listen to a list like that and you think, yeah, well, most of them haven't even, quote, succeeded, right? But I would say, I would submit to you that number one, all of these disparate movements are indeed part of the same tectonic shift going on in our country and in the world right now. And that is a shift in which many smalls are now pushing back in a great way against a few bigs. We live in a time where monopolized concentrated power can no longer maintain its monopoly. And that is true in dictatorships of the Middle East. It is true in the party structures of American politics. It is true, heck, even outside of politics in the way that we make our choices in media consumption, in transportation options, that the age of monopolies and duopolies is ending. And people are pushing back against them, sometimes with gleeful consumerist spirit, sometimes with angry political force, uh, sometimes with violence. But that we live in a time of this great push back that I think is our moment. And we all feel this, and you might ask, well, how does a great pushback like this happen? A great push like this happens as the natural consequence and reaction, at least here in the United States, of four decades of unrelenting concentration of wealth, unrelenting concentration of voice, unrelenting concentration of clout. We live in a country where under both parties, administrations of both parties, the share of national income since 1980, going to the top 1%, has tripled from 8% to nearly 24%, while the share of national income going to the bottom 50% of American households has gone inversely in the other direction from about 20% to 8%. And even in our so-called recovery since the Great Recession, over 90% of the gains of the recovery have gone to the top 1%. And so, when people who are perhaps less sophisticated than all of us here in this room, who are less fluent and literate in the particulars of power, say in a very coarse, blunt way, the game is freaking rigged. They're not wrong. In fact, they're profoundly right. There has been a multi-decade rigging of the game. And that game has taken the form of tax policy, tax subsidies at the individual and the corporate level, it has taken the form of deregulation and union busting. It has taken the form of all manner of policies, economic and otherwise, that reward the already privileged for being privileged. And you can't have, at least in a nominal republic, you can't have four decades of that kind of unrelenting concentration and monopolization of voice, power, and wealth without there being a great push back. And that is why we have what we have, and that is why it is this incredibly, and to me, excitingly, cross-ideological and cross-partisan great pushback. Black Lives Matter and the Tea Party don't go to a lot of tea parties together. <laughs> and our, in my work at Citizen University, I know this because I work with the co-founders and the leaders of both Black Lives Matter and the Tea Party. I work with people who are leading dreamers and activists on behalf of undocumented immigrants. I work with people who are leaders of this generation of Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. I work with people who are at the forefront of the $15 Now movement and the movement more broadly to enhance worker power and worker voice in this country. And all these folks, though they may seem to be from different ideological islands, are singing the same song right now. And it is a song of bottom-up people power. What I'd like to do tonight is to unpack a bit about what I mean when I talk about this moment of bottom-up people power. Uh, and what I'd like to do in particular is really lay it out in three simple ideas of power, character, and purpose. And say a few words about each of these. Power. I've already used the word power many times. My new book is called You're More Powerful Than You Think. And so I think I owe you a definition. What do I mean when I say power? Right? On one level, again, a room as sophisticated as this, you all have your notions of what power is. Uh, you all could write it down and articulate it to somebody else. But here's how I define it. I define power as a capacity to ensure that others do as you would have them do. Now, to some folks, that's kind of menacing. 
it's kind of uh, unseemly even. Um, to some people it sounds a little bit, you know, Tony Soprano, like, uh, <laughs> it'd be a shame if you didn't do what I want you to do, right? <laughs> um, but let's be candid with each other. At every scale of human relationship, I'm not talking just national politics in our civic lives, in our relationships with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors and our loved ones. <clears throat> we are constantly in these give and take dynamics where we are trying to ensure that others do as we would like them to do. We do that through a variety of channels. That capacity, when applied to questions not of merely private interpersonal consequence, but when applied to matters of public import and civic consequence, is what I define as civic power. And so when I talk about power, <clears throat> both in general and in our work at Citizen University, that's how I define it. And I think there are three laws of civic power that are worth enumerating to help us make sense of this time right now where so much is in flux and up for grabs. Law number one is this, and I've already described it to you. Power concentrates. It compounds. Left to itself, any system, certainly an economic system, but even a natural ecosystem, left to itself, which in French, laissez-faire, in a laissez-faire approach to systems, eventually in those systems, all of the goods and the resources in that system, whether it's dollars or whether it's seeds floating around an ecosystem, clump, they concentrate. One small corner of that ecosystem starts to get more and more, and by getting more, they get more. And that concentration, of wealth, power, opportunity, voice, reputation, attention, compounds in ways that make the game essentially a game of monopoly, where the end, the outcome is a winner-take-all kind of outcome. That's, when we play the board game, that's how, quote unquote, someone wins, right? But in the non-board game context of actual life, the point of being in a self-governing democratic republic is to ensure that we don't get to one person having all the goodies and everybody else having nothing so that everybody else just gets to the point where they don't want to play, they want to knock the table over that the game board is on, right? The 2016 election was a little bit of a warning of what it will look like when enough people say, let's knock over the game board, let's knock over the table. So law number one, power concentrates. And P.S., so does powerlessness. So does absence of voice. So does marginality. It is darn expensive in the United States to be poor, right? And you might think, well, that ain't right, but that's how it is. It's incredibly regressive and compoundingly regressive to start out poor in this country. So power compounds is law number one. Law number two, power justifies itself. Now, again, you can picture this in relationships people you know, family, you know. But again, let's think about this in the civic sphere. Power justifies itself in a hundred ways at all times. It those justifications, these rationalizations of why the powerful are powerful take different forms. Sometimes they take the form of explanations about you know, why it is that politics isn't really women's work or why it is that uh, African Americans really aren't cut out for self-government, or why it is that uh, you know, people who uh, have uh, different uh, uh, sexual orientations and preferences um, are defective, right? Stories and explanations about why it is that people who have the power to define the dominant norms in society have the power. Here's another one from economic life, trickle-down economics. The ideology, the storyline, let me call it the fantasy of trickle-down economics, which tells us that we must coddle the already wealthy because only then will we have a chance at having some of their wealth leak down to the rest of us and that the true origins of prosperity in a society are well-coddled, wealthy people is a story. It is a story not particularly grounded in science, fact, or economics, but it is a story, and it is a story that when, stand, when it is stood up against not a competing story, but against nothing, it is a story that can win, right? And so trickle-down economics is one example of 
ideology, narrative, kind of propagandistic notions of why things are. Just so stories. And the other examples that I used of whether male supremacy or white supremacy, um, though I was making allusions to things that were said in this country a century ago, let me be very clear, I'm not talking about stuff that's just in history books. There are plenty of people um, in every state of the union who still subscribe, uh, at least privately and increasingly, they're willing to subscribe publicly uh, to those views that, uh, uh, that they have power because that's the natural order of things. So if you take these two laws, that power compounds, it concentrates, and that power justifies itself, just these two laws alone lead you to a pretty grim situation. They lead you to this doom loop, this kind of dictatorial doom loop where one person hoards all and then tells you why it's the divine right, the divine order of things that he should be hoarding and you should be begging, right? And that is literally the way that divine right worked in the age of feudalism. Uh, it's the way that uh, something akin to divine right unfolds in dictatorships uh, that run the gamut from Ecuador to the Middle East to uh, Asia. If all we had were laws number one and two, we'd be stuck, we'd be screwed. What saves us from that doom loop is law number three, which is this, power is infinite. And I want you to sit with that for a second, because you might be thinking, who is this woo-woo Seattle guy coming up to the stage here <laughs> and telling me in this new age way, in a quiet voice, power is infinite, right? Um, I'm not giving you a Deepak Chopra line. I'm not talking about kind of our chi or anything. Uh, I am talking about this simple fact, that power in civic life is very different from, for instance, energy in a physical system, right? Physics teaches us that, the, you know, the laws of thermodynamics teach us that if you get more energy, then someone in the system is going to have to get less because it's a finite zero-sum game, right? Um, and we derive from that physical reality a bunch of intuitions about the rest of our lives. But here's the thing. I'm not talking physics. I'm talking civics. And in civic life, we can generate brand new power out of thin air where it did not previously exist, or where it was merely dormant and, and unactivated. And we do that through the magical act of organizing. When I invite one other human to join me in a common endeavor, that endeavor doesn't even have to be about national politics. It can be, let's start a garden club. It can be, let's figure out a bike lane uh, in this neighborhood. It can be, let's, let's do a homework thing for our kids. When I decide to engage one other human in some common endeavor, we begin that work of figuring out what the shape of that common endeavor ought to be, and what the means of attaining that common endeavor ought to be. We have begun, without even knowing it, to engage in a magic act. We've been generating power out of thin air. And this notion that power can be generated out of thin air in a way that is not about someone else losing it is best demonstrated by this simple example. If you or you or you learn how to give a great public speech or learn how to uh, lobby your member of Congress super effectively or learn how to build a great email list that gets tons of subscribers and people responding or learn how to mobilize people to show up for a march and a rally and how to design that face-to-face -face experience with a sense of ritual and play that makes people want to come back. If any of you learn how to do any of that stuff, you have not diminished by one whit my ability to do the same thing. All you have done is added to the net amount of civic power now circulating in our ecosystem. And it is this fact that power is infinite that is our savior in the face of that doom loop of laws number one and two. Now, I will grant that most of the time, most people don't realize law number three. Most of the time, most people do have an intuition that we are stuck in zero-sum games with finite amounts of power, and that the game is rigged by somebody else, and that somebody else is going to rig it in perpetuity, and so what's the point in me getting involved? I will grant that a lot of people have that both intuition, and indeed have encoded that intuition into behaviors that they're passing on to the next generation. 
But when I talk about us living through an extraordinary moment right now, what makes it extraordinary is that millions of Americans who've had that intuition for a long, long time are discarding it. They are shedding it. They are cracking their way out of it, busting their way out of the limitations of that intuition. And that is the moment that we're in right now that I think is so exciting. When I think about power, though, and when I describe it these ways, if you look at all the movements that are described, you know, one way to think about this is, oh, well, Eric's talking about kind of big, visible movements, right? Whether it's Tea Party or it's uh, Occupy or $15 or Black Lives Matter. And yes, those are very important parts of this surge in this age that we live in. But everything I've just told you about the infinitude of civic power is actually best and most tangibly felt on the most local level, in the most mundane of scenarios, in dealing with your town council, in dealing with a county commission, in dealing with a state legislature, in dealing with people who you can see on questions, the consequences of which you can feel immediately. It's on these kinds of questions, particularly in a state like New Hampshire, that has not only the tradition, but the setup for face-to-face -face engagement and interaction that allows you, indeed almost requires you, to practice power in this way and reminds you that there is no such thing fundamentally as being a non-participant, right? There's no such thing as not voting. Not voting is voting. Not voting is voting to hand your power over to someone else and to someone whose interests may be inimical to your own. Not participating is participating. It is actively throwing and giving your power away to someone who will be very happy to take advantage of your absence or your silence to organize other people and to have to organize fewer people than they thought they'd have to organize in order to dominate you. Right? There is no such thing as not participating. And so when I talk about power in these terms, the reason why I do this and the reason why so much of our work at Citizen University and this book of mine that's out now is focused on this term is that I came to a recognition that all of you, particularly those of you at the uh, New Hampshire Institute for Civics Education, have come to in recent years, which is twofold. Number one, we are in this free fall crisis of a collapse of civic knowledge in this country. Um, and you've all heard the rehearsed, the kind of chilling, nearly laughable if they weren't so tragic statistics that more people could name a judge on The Voice or American Idol than could name a justice on the US Supreme Court. Um, justice Souter was telling me earlier that uh, more than 50% of Americans uh, believe um, that the phrase, uh, uh, each according to his needs, uh, whatever the Marxian phrase is, uh, uh, to, to each according to his uh, uh, needs and from each according to his abilities um, is part of the US Constitution. Um, you know, and um, again, right? A group like us can chuckle, even if gruefully. Um, but there are many more rooms of many more people saying, what's so funny? Are you laughing at me? Are you laughing at my ignorance? L let me show you what I think of you laughing at my ignorance, right? And that is the politics that we're in right now. And so number one, this recognition that we are in this free fall of civic knowledge in this country, but that number two, particularly with younger people, I believe, but frankly, with people of every generation right now, the way to reactivate intrinsic motivation to learn civics, right, so that it's not just eat your vegetables or do your duty, is to make it a little bit sexy. And the way you make civics a little bit sexy is not just to talk about how a bill becomes a law, but to talk about it in terms of power. Every, the eighth graders I spent time with today, they may or may not be super interested in the budget reconciliation process. They may or may not want to get too much into the nitty gritty of the appeals process in the United States federal courts, right? They may or may not know the difference between authorization and appropriation, but they get power. They're at an age in their lives where they get power. They're pushing against boundaries. They're finding their own identities. They're trying to establish their own voice. They're beginning 
to find both the courage and the emboldenedness to ask, why, why are we doing things this way? Why is it that just because adults all my life have said that it ought to be this way, why should I accept this? What an incredibly ripe time to say, ah, since you're in that frame of mind, let me come over here. Let me give you this incredible set of stories about people who ask just the same kinds of questions, right? Some of them were people in the 1770s, right here in New Hampshire. Some of them were people in the 1850s, also right here in New Hampshire, who were calling for abolition and saying, why does it have to be the way that everybody says it is? Some of them were people right here in New Hampshire in the 1950s saying, why is it that we continue to tolerate a nominal union where the former Confederacy still essentially runs a Confederate show? That at every generational turn, you had young people saying, I want to exercise my power to blow up the status quo ante, right? And so this is how we make civics relevant, how we make civics meaningful, how we make it tangible, particularly to young people. We make it unabashedly and unapologetically about power. But then this brings me to the second thing that I wanted to speak about tonight. Because if all we do is make sure that young people are fluent in and literate in power, if all we do is make sure that they understand in these terms that is somewhere between Game of Thrones and House of Cards, you know, this dark picture of the dark arts of how you move and manipulate, manipulate people, um, then all we will have done is to have raised a new generation of sociopaths. <laughs> and I believe, actually, that as complicated a topic as citizenship is, that in some ways can be reduced to a very simple formula. That citizenship equals power plus character. Fluency in power alone, without a grounding in civic character, is sociopathy. A grounding in civic character and ethics alone, without any fluency in power, is mere philosophizing. Right? It is the combination of the two. Understanding how stuff gets done, figuring out who decides, injecting yourself into the process of decision, that's literacy and power. But coupling that literacy with a moral sense. And when I say character, I'm not talking about individual virtue. I'm not talking about perseverance or honesty or diligence. Those things are important, yes. But I'm talking about character in the collective. I'm talking about social virtues. I'm talking about what Adam Smith in his second, and I would actually say in some ways more consequential book, Beyond the Wealth of Nations, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. I'm talking about what he called moral sentiments. Ethics of mutuality, of reciprocity, of shared responsibility, of shared sacrifice. An ethic that life, whether it's politics or family or economics, is not a one-time scorched earth game. It is a game of infinite repeat play with the same players. And so don't be a jerk. Don't burn the people you're going to play with over and over and over again. This notion of character in the collective is about being a pro-social contributor to community, right? And this notion of character is not something that is just about what we read in texts or what we get in faith traditions, though we can derive it both through, through both of those channels. At the end of the day, this deeper notion of civic character is something that is most powerfully instantiated and imparted through deeds. I can talk about mutuality and reciprocity, but then the question comes if a friend or a neighbor who lacks health insurance is stricken with an illness that will bankrupt her, am I or am I not going to be part of a posse of people who decides to come together and pool some money to help her get through paying those hospital bills? I can say I'm for respect and tolerance, but the question comes up not on big policy questions or big visible moments like election day, but on those little moments like when you're, when you're on the bus and a recent refugee wearing a hijab starts taking flack and abuse from some other people on that bus. And you have to make this silent, immediate, infinitely huge calculation. Do I just keep it to myself? Or do I say something, right? Deeds, 
choices. Our lives are saturated, suffused with these kinds of choices every day. And the ways that we form other people, not just the young people in our lives, but we form each other, is a matter of mindfulness. And this notion of civic character is imparted by mindfulness about our deeds and our choices. It's those deeds and choices that animate any notion of creed, right? I love, as, a, as the child of immigrants from China, as a second generation American, I will take a backseat to nobody in my belief in the exceptional nature of the American creed, of the power of the ideas that are embedded in our charter documents, in the Declaration, the preamble of the Constitution, the Seneca Falls Declaration, in the Gettysburg Address, so on and so forth. I take a backseat to nobody. But all of that, at the end of the day, is just blah, 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 blah. Until and unless we enact those words with deeds. And that we, the other thing that makes our moment exceptional right now is that we are being reawakened to that fact. We are being reawakened to the moral consequences of our everyday choices. And again, this is why, even though there is much darkness afoot in our politics right now, I am net optimistic. I am net optimistic because I look around our country and I think about the ways in which people, from the libertarian right to reform conservatives to social justice progressives to big government liberals, all of them across the board these last hundred days have swarmed to protect disfavored groups, have swarmed to support independent journalism, have swarmed in defense of and in the promotion of literacy about the, ju the judicial system of the United States. That all of us are remembering that institutions are just blah, 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 words, codes, pieces of paper, except and when and inasmuch as we animate them with our choices and our deeds and how we show up for one another. And that is the measure of our character. Well, that brings me to the third and the final theme that I wanted to speak about tonight. Because if you have this fluency and power, and you've coupled it with this grounding of character, grounding in character, then the question, of course, is, well, what do we do? Where do we begin? How do we go forth? Right? And it is an exciting time, and there is this surge of civic engagement not seen in half a century that we are in the midst of right now in all these different ways, where groups that run the gamut from the ACLU, uh, with all of its work in defense of uh, disfavored minorities and immigrants and others, uh, to the Federalist Society, um, with its work now trying to remind folks um, in its what they call their Article I project of the importance of Congress and why Congress is Article I in the Constitution and why we all, whether left or right, ought to be attuned to the dangers of executive branch overreach. That people across the left and the right are getting excited about basically making civics sexy again, right? And this is this great moment. But then you ask yourself, how do we sustain this, right? Some of you will be going to science marches tomorrow. Some of you went to tax marches last weekend. Many of you were part of women's marches and other marches. Some of you might have gone to Trump rallies. Some of you have been to Sanders rallies. And you all know that there is a limit to the number of rallies you can go to. <laughs> there's a physical limit. And you also know that there's a limit to the amount of good that comes out of simply going to the rallies, right? And the question of how we sustain boils down to this notion of purpose. I'm getting, I get asked because of the nature of what I do, I get asked by so many people in so many parts of the country, okay, I'm awake, I'm aware, I understand it's time to kind of show up and get involved, but where do I start, what do I do? And my answer has been kind of two different three word glib, seemingly glib answers, but I mean them. Actually, one is two words, one is three words. The two word is this. When people ask, you know, I don't know, should I get involved in immigrant rights? Should I get involved in democracy reform? Should I get involved in this? Um, and uh, my two word answer is pick anything. And then when they say, well, what do you mean pick anything? I said, pick anything, pick any issue. Just choose one. And then commit yourself over time to diving in and spending some capital, some of your time, some of your voice, some of your social capital and energy on that issue. 
learn who advances and promotes that issue. Figure out if there's some meaningful way that you can contribute to the advancement of that issue. Maybe after three, six months, you realize, you know what? That issue isn't for me, or that issue I like, but other people have got this, and my help could be used better on some other issue. But it starts with picking anything, because the sense of being paralyzed by too many choices, which so many people have been experiencing, um, is one that you can only bust through by all, nearly at random picking something. The three-word glib answer when people ask, what do I do, where do I begin, is be like Ben, by which I mean Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin was, as most of you probably know, an inveterate, habitual, practically addicted club maker. Right? I couldn't stop forming clubs and associations and groups, philosophical societies, stamp collecting clubs, organizing the first subscription library, organizing the first volunteer fire department, organizing the precursor of what became the University of Pennsylvania, uh, but organizing groups at pubs, the Junto, and other you know, tra tradesmen's groups for having discussions and debates about politics. And what he had was this instinct that was not only about sociability, obviously he was not an introvert, but it's not about introversion, extroversion. It was a sociability combined with a certain measure of self-interest. All this club making was not just for the good of the realm, it's pretty darn good for Benjamin Franklin's printing business too, <laughs> right? And having that spirit of join a club or start a club and don't feel like you've gotta do so as an altruist, do so in a way that's gonna make you feel like you're getting to have a fuller sense of yourself. You're getting to find an opportunity to express a fuller range of your talents and your capacities. You're getting to advance a bigger sense of your own self-interest, right? Because, back to my notion of civic character, if we're being grown-up citizens, all self-interest is mutual interest. And we see that. And so join a club, start a club. And the thing about club making, and the thing about picking any issue of people who care about that issue, is that that work of joining with others, getting out of your isolation, getting out of your little Twitter feed or, f or Facebook feed, is that it feeds what I believe to be the a yearning that has similarly blossomed over the same four decades during which American life has become more unequal, more cruel, more atomized, more grindingly, crushingly hard for more people. And that is a yearning to be part of something bigger than yourself, where you have a sense of dignity. My friend Arthur Brooks, who runs the American Enterprise Institute, who and, I, and when I say my friend, he's right of center and I'm left of center. And I, but I don't mean it in the way that people in DC say, my friend across the aisle, when what they really mean is they want to stick a knife through their guts, right? <laughs> uh, I, I mean my friend Arthur Brooks, who um, is a very interesting thinker and a heterodox um, person who's trying to rethink the meaning of freedom and conservatism um, and is actually probably shaped by the fact that he grew up a jazz-loving kid in Seattle. Um, and is not, it kind of has a lot of unconventional things in his background. My friend Arthur Brooks talks about what he calls a dignity deficit in this country. And so much of the great pushback that I was describing at the outset of my remarks is a result of this dignity deficit. What connects? What possibly connects the people that J.D. Vance writes about in Hillbilly Elegy, the former blue collar workers of Appalachia who've lost their industrial or auto manufacturing jobs to NAFTA or to or people in the South who've lost their textile making jobs to Vietnam or people, P.S., here in New England who've lost those same jobs to other parts of the world. What connects those people who are largely white, who grew up largely with a certain sense of, shall we say it, entitlement? about what the American dream was gonna be and owed them. What connects them with an undocumented immigrant who has to live in the shadows, who now more than ever is scared to step out in public? What connects them to the 20-something African American who's decided that she's gonna put her body on the line for Black Lives Matter because it is her body that she believes the state, the government, and the people of the United States do not see or respect. What connects all of these people is a dignity deficit. 
a sense that this society does not see them, does not feel them, does not recognize them. And I want to flip this from an us-them thing because I submit to you that everybody in this room has some basis upon which you too have felt in these crushingly hard times in American life, this time of flux and change, not only of inequality but of demographic shifts, that you too have felt a sense of identity and dignity under threat, a sense of certainty being caved in. Let's be honest with each other. And so purposeful work of citizenship means joining clubs with people in a way that isn't just about, okay, let's divvy up the tasks and you do a phone tree, I'll do the email list. But first, joining those clubs so that you can see each other face to face and see each other and rehumanize each other and rehumanize our politics. And when you become and belong, become part of and belong to a group of other humans who see you, again, I saw this feature the other night on TV about the hard right-wing militias, the 3% groups and the Oath Keepers groups. And then I saw, saw another news story about some of the gangs that are so much at the heart of gang violence in Chicago, which is in this bloodbath of gun homicides. And my first thought was, these are the same people. They have found, in their different ways, a sense of community and a sense of purpose and a sense of identity, and a way to say, if society will not see me, I will make a club in which I will feel seen, and then I will make the rest of the country have to see me. Purpose. Well, I want to close by stitching these things together, and I want to close, as I promised, with just a moment of reflection on what it means to, quote, live free or die. What does it mean? There are two people I want to tell you about, two books that I've read that have shaped me a lot. I want to think about that slogan, live free or die. <clears throat> One is uh, by a political historian, uh, I think emeritus now, perhaps retired, at Brandeis named David Hackett Fisher, who uh, had written many, many books on kind of the elements of the formation of American political identity, particularly from the colonial era on. And one of his books is called simply Liberty and Freedom. And it's a book actually, um, it's a doorstop of a book, it's heavy. Um, but, it, but it's worth getting because it's mainly images. He went through this incredible process of sifting through American culture from pre-colonial times to essentially the years after 9-11, looking for icons and images and symbols and iconography that have been used from the time of Liberty Poles and Liberty Bells to don't tread on me flags, to 9-11 ribbons, and all points between, right? And what the, what's so fascinating about this book, Liberty and Freedom, is that the title itself contains an, arg an argument, which is that liberty and freedom are not the same thing. We Americans sort of lazily use them interchangeably, right? But he begins by reminding us etymologically that liberty has its roots in a Latin notion of essentially being not in a state of bondage, being not a slave, and that liberty had meaning only in the context of slavery, right? And to have liberty was to be in a condition of not having been enslaved. Freedom, however, etymologically, has its roots in the old Germanic and Norse tribes, and the origins of that word freedom are closer to the same word roots that give us the word friend. That freedom is about being in the fellowship of others. That the only freedom that is meaningful, the only way, if you're living in the woods of what is now Germany or Norway, and you're a tribesman, you're trying to make it, that, there, that you did not make it in those woods through what we would now call rugged individualism. You made it in those woods with friends. And that it was a circle and a council of friends who learned to help one another, who learned the practices of mutual aid and learned that it was only through mutual aid that an individual could fulfill his or her greatest potential in freedom. 
Liberty is different from freedom. And so I love the fact that your slogan is not live in liberty or die. Live free or die. Live free. Live in friendship. Live in fellowship. Live in the reminded realization that the only meaningful liberty that comes in a republic comes not in atomization and isolation, but in a fabric of relationship and obligation. And that brings me to the second book that I want to tell you about and close with here. And there's a book, I ought to be collecting royalties for this guy because I, I sell his book everywhere I go. <laughs> I sell it more than I sell my own book. This is a book called, by, by a guy named C. Terry Warner, who is a, another retired academic, a retired professor of social psychology at BYU in Utah. And though um, he is a practicing Mormon, the book is not at all religious uh, or explicitly uh, religious. Uh, the book is called Bonds That Make Us Free. And I, thought, I think about that book a lot, but again, I think about it particularly in the context of your state slogan here, Bonds That Make Us Free. What C. Terry Warner describes as bonds that make us free is this. He describes at every scale, every fractal scale of human interaction, whether it's you and your loved one, Concord and Manchester, New Hampshire and Vermont, the North and the South, the United States and Europe, the West and the rest, that at every circle of identity, every fractal scale of identity, humans fall into the same pattern, and it's a pattern of relentless self-justification. And the pattern goes like this. I accuse you in order to excuse me. Right? And so he describes this as, and again, you can think about it. Let's root it back in the one-on-one. In the -on -one. I can say to my wife, after a long day, hey, why don't you take out the garbage? And she can look at me and without missing a beat say, well, why didn't you wash the dishes? Right? And you can scale up from that. Hey, black lives matter. Hey, well, why don't blue lives matter? You can scale up from that to the debates about Middle East peace, to the polarization between Republicans and Democrats, that we all as humans, but especially in our polarized times today, fall into this habit of instead of taking responsibility for our piece of how we got to where we are, we accused excuse. And what C. Terry Warner talks about is this miraculously simple and catastrophically hard thing to do. And that is to break that cycle of collusion. And you break it only one way, which is to start by saying, you know what? My bad. My bad. And that to so many people in every setting, that feels like a preemptive surrender. That feels like a yielding of power. That feels like a giving away of your leverage, right? No good negotiator who knows the art of the deal would ever say at the outset, my bad. But what C. Terry Warner teaches us and reminds us is that the only way we become free of our cycles of self-justification and can learn to see one another and then see the problems that we've created together is for one of us to start by saying, my bad. I own a piece of this. You think about some of the most fraught debates in our politics right now, debates about white privilege, for instance, and race. And if I were white, and I'm not, but my wife is, my wife is white from Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And she has relatives who bristle at any notion of white privilege, right? And they bristle partly because they don't feel privileged in that same way that they feel unseen and stuck in a dignity deficit, and I feel that, I get that. But they bristle as well because it feels like they're being attacked, right? It feels like they're being called racists if you say that there is such a thing as white privilege. And so my way in, in that conversation, is to say, you know what? My piece of this is this. As an Asian American, I've been depicted 
all my life as a member of what's called the model minority. And for too many years of my life, I let that label stick. And I didn't question it. And I didn't think about the ways in which, hmm, if the majority is calling one group a model minority, that kind of implies that other groups are not so model. It kind of implies that African Americans, Hispanic Americans, are to be judged, to be looked down upon, and that Asian Americans are to be petted on the head for being a model minority, right? When I realized that, and this is what I say to folks as my way of opening up the conversation, when I realize how much I have let pass and never challenged until my, till after college, well into adulthood, well past when I should have known better. To put it another way, to think about how many years of my life I silently collected the unearned privilege of being a non-black, non-white person. When I think about that, I have to say, Shame on me. Shame on me in my silence and ignorance for having colluded in a system of language that reinforces a racial hierarchy in which white is right, white is right, and darker is worse. And that's how I crack open a conversation on that topic. But I invite you, whatever the topic may be, it might be about race, it might be about taxes, it might be about policing, it might be about immigration, whatever it is, to think about how can you initiate the breaking of that accused to excuse cycle? And how can we together refashion some bonds of trust and affection and rehumanization that will in fact make us finally, truly able to live free? With that spirit in mind, with a fluency in power, with a grounding in character, with an activated sense of common purpose, let us all commit to building the bonds that will make us free. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that observation and that question. I, I, I not only could not agree more, I think it better than that. Um, one of the things that I read about <clears throat> uh, in this new book, beyond the three laws of power and three different paradigms of power that come from that, um, is this notion of interest. And I agree that it is a fool's errand to hope that people at any large scale will ever become altruistic. Self-interestedness is a part of the human condition. Self-interest is a constant in human nature. 
But what is not constant, what indeed changes routinely, generationally, is, as you say, people's perceptions and perhaps even more important, conceptions and narratives of what constitutes their self-interest, right? And so, I think part of the key to rewiring people's story of what their self-interest is, is to attend to story and to unpack the ways in which we wittingly and unwittingly have these narratives in our head that we repeat back to other people in different settings about why things are. <coughs> I used the example earlier of trickle-down economics. Right? That is a story not only about the origins of prosperity, but it's a story about where my self-interest self lies as somebody who is not wealthy. My self-interest lies in making sure that the wealthy do get taken care of so that they can create jobs for me. Right? And in a previous book called Cards of Democracy, my co-author and I basically had the simple intuition that you can't beat something with nothing. And that if you wanted to challenge that narrative conception of self-interest, you have to have an alternative story. And so what we put forward was a notion not of trickle-down economics, but what we call middle-out economics. That the true origins of prosperity are not at the top. That prosperity emerges truly and most durably from the middle out and the bottom up. That it is when workers have more money, that businesses have more customers, and that you set in motion a positive feedback loop of increasing demand. And that it is therefore in everybody's shared self-interest for us to raise the wage at the bottom, right? Because that means that that person, he used to be making eight or nine bucks an hour, but now is making 12 or 13 or 15 bucks an hour, has a little more money to spend at that restaurant or at your florist or at the grocery store. And that money circulates and it redounds to the collective benefit. And we boil down that notion to, again, something that I know sounds woo, but it is actually something close to scientific fact. When you study the science of complex adaptive systems, in business. We're all better off, and we're all better off. <laughs> right? That is, you can quarrel with me about that, but I would just put forward, but I, I would welcome that quarrel because we would now be quarreling on my terms. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the key. This now we've begun to quarrel about my default setting for how you should conceptualize your self interest. Right? Um, and so I think this is another good one, which I think. I pray, and indeed I'm starting to decide I should be part of the answer to this. I, I think there is this, this window, maybe it's closing rapidly, this window of opportunity to have young, particularly men of color in our cities who are plagued by poverty and gun violence and drugs to find some common, not only narrative, but sense of shared faith and shared story and shared interest with the folks in this state and other states who are mainly white, who are getting devastated by the opioid epidemic. Right? Now, of course, the system is beginning to treat them in similar ways, or beginning to reckon with criminal justice reform uh, and how we deal with these kinds of things um, and these epidemics in similar ways. But I'm talking about from the bottom up. How do we get these folks to begin to see themselves as part of the same story, right? And having a shared interest in changing our criminal justice system, in changing the prison industrial complex, in changing so many of the systems we have uh, in the United States. So I, I think it does fundamentally turn around this art of story. In, in the book, when I talk about this, the three laws, I, I, I talk about how there are three imperatives that derive from those laws. If power concentrates into winner take all games, Imperative number one is, you gotta change the game. If power justifies itself all the time in these just so stories of why things are, you gotta change the story. And if power is infinite, and yet most people most of the time think they're stuck in these finite zero sum games and, and, and systems, you gotta change the equation, right? But the middle one of changing the story is the middle one for a reason. It is the pivot point here. We humans are wired for narrative. And we have to think about using story. I mean, heck, half of you are here from the uh, New Hampshire Humanities Council. I don't have to tell you the importance of story, right? But the importance of story in politics and civic life in changing people's malleable conceptions of self-interest. Uh, I cannot overstate that. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, 
I see one hand here and then another one behind here. So why don't we start with you in front? Hi, I'm here if you could address issues of class yes. and the extent to which uh, class issues are embedded in the ideal that you are uh, discussing. Uh, as, as a teacher, I know that uh, students uh, from backgrounds rooted in poverty, their parents don't have any less desire to be active in their kids' lives, educational lives, but the opportunity is not there. And I, I, there's a little sort of, uh, I don't want to say it's a little less of a leash, but, but there seems to be a sense that people who have time and effort, uh, or, or have the time to exert effort, um, uh, might play a, a larger role than they should in these reform movements? Uh, it's a very interesting and complicated question, and I think, um, you know, class, uh, we, we are in a moment right now where, I mean, class has been a topic that has always been hard for Americans to name, because at least for the better part of the 20th century, we like to tell a story of ourselves as a middle class nation. And everybody, no matter how far they were drifting in either direction from the middle class, still wanted to call themselves middle class. I think we're getting over that reluctance mainly because the middle class is disappearing. And people find themselves increasingly on one pole or another, right? Slipping backwards and falling down um, into a state where it'd be really hard to scrape up $500 for an emergency on one end. Uh, and over here, thinking about the ways in which you're compounding gains of your um, investment savings and the stock market boom are redounding to your benefit. Um, and the disappearance of a middle class economy in this country um, is a part of the political tectonic shifts that we're seeing. Uh, I think, I mean, it's a topic, the question of, of class, uh, but, but I, I think I would say one thing, which is that our job Sometimes people ask me, well, Eric, you're being kind of value neutral here if you want to throw into one bucket Tea Party, Black Lives Matter, radical libertarians, you know, dreamers, $15 now. Um, and, uh, and I say, that's, that's a fair point. I'm not saying I agree with everybody's views on stuff. Um, I have a point of view about, uh, and I will differ with my friends uh, on the right about a policy preference or whatever it might be. Um, but Here's the standard that I use, and it relates to class, for determining whether um, and how much I want to play with somebody who nominally, at least, is interested in um, increasing bottom-up citizen power. My question is this. Are you interested in generating bottom-up citizen power in order to include more people into the circle of opportunity or to hoard? Right? Some people want to hoard by race. Some people want to hoard by region. Some people want to hoard by class. Some of you probably saw in the New York Times that story the other day made me want to throw up about TAs in Santa Monica, California, you know, where the highly affluent can't bear to see their PTA dollars being used for the somewhat less affluent schools in their community um, uh, be because, again, people have grown in this polarized fraying time to believe that it's mine. And if it's mine, there's no such thing as a mutual interest. There's no such thing as a common cause, right? Um, and so I think we have to be, all of us, conscious of the ways in which people are drifting toward those attitudes and asking ourselves as a litmus, litmus test for almost everything we do. Is it about inclusion or is it about hoarding? And that's not just about economics, right? Um, my daughter's a high school senior. She just found out where she's going to college. And um, to the surprise of some people, because both uh, I and her mother are alum alumni of Yale College, um, she didn't get into Yale. And uh, there's a good reason why she didn't get into Yale. She didn't earn it, <laughs> right? She's a smart kid. She had good grades. She's going to an excellent um, private liberal arts school, um, but she didn't earn it. And here's the thing that I made, a decision that I made as the school year started, because I'm a very active Yale alum. 
And I have lots of opportunities to have conversations with my friend, the dean of Yale College, or my acquaintance, the president of Yale University, or folks who are involved in this stuff. And I had to make a simple choice at the beginning whether I was going to use my connections, and my knowledge, and my relationships to widen the circle of inclusion or to hoard. And I made a pretty quick decision early on, and to hold myself to that decision, I said explicitly to every person in power at Yale who I knew, I don't want you to even take it into consideration. I want you to say nothing about this. The work that I and Citizen University do with Yale is going to continue no matter what. I don't even want this to be part of the conversation. And if my daughter doesn't get in, so be it, right? And a lot of people said to me, you're a fool, man. <laughs> you, could have, you could have pulled some strings. You could, have, you, know, you could have rigged the game. You're kind of a sucker. <laughs> Maybe I am. But I think every one of us has these choices to make about, uh, and not all of them are wonderful choices about Yale College versus another awesome selective college. But even little choices, am I widening the circle of inclusion or am I hoarding? And that's a way of thinking that's not just about class as a concept, but it's about what are we trying to do to make sure that more people have more opportunity to participate in economic and political life. There, there's a question farther back. Yes, sir. I can't help noticing that in all this activism lately, uh, they're all private groups. They're not uh, political parties, Republican, Democrat, Libertarian, Greens. Would you care to comment on what this may be doing to quote the established Great question, just to paraphrase for the cameras. <clears throat> um, the gentleman couldn't help but observe that all of this activism right now is not coming from establishment political institutions, whether parties or um, party leaders. Um, and uh, I think that that is precisely because we are in a moment where people want to knock over establishments, number one. Uh, but it's also, number two, because these establishments um, have yet to fully adapt to the networked a la carte age that we live in, right? We don't live in an age anymore in politics, in TV choices, in music choices, in housing and transportation choices. We don't live in a world of choose one from column A or B. We live in a world where we pick and choose elements from A and B, and we don't wait for permission from anybody to tell us what our choices are, right? And I think that this is a big part of what the Sanders push was against the DNC. It was certainly what the incredible Trump phenomenon was in slaying every single establishment figure who walked the path in front of Donald Trump, right? I was speaking to a reporter from the union leader before we got started here today. And it's worth contemplating, had Donald Trump lost the Electoral College um, and, and Hillary Clinton was president right now, we would still right now be in the 90th, 95th day of incredible autopsies of the Republican Party, right? People would be asking, how did Donald Trump cause the Republican Party to commit suicide and fracture and implode like this, right? Because he won, those autopsies are not being had or those conversations are not being held, but the underlying reality of it is still there, right? And it's playing out in the challenges that they face in governing right now. And I don't say this as a partisan matter, although you know, individually as a Democrat, I might take a certain amount of uh, satisfaction in seeing their difficulties. But as an American, what I observe mainly is what you've observed, which is that both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are really slow-footed and unable to reckon with the ways in which citizens from the bottom up want to blow up their channels of choices and their ways of doing stuff, right? So indivisible which many of you know of, and I bet many of you have been part of, but for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Indivisible is a, started out as a movement now that began right after the, uh, even before, right after the inauguration as a 26-page document that a group of congressional, former congressional staffers, Democratic staffers, wrote explaining to you, the citizen, how to apply piercing kind of acupuncture-like pressure on your member of Congress, right? and apply pressure to make that member of Congress buckle and do what you want him to do, right? And it was an insider's guide to how and when to show up where to be heard and seen so that your member can't but do what you want him to do. 
And this guide, which was just shared online as a Google Doc, number one, went incredibly viral on social media, on Facebook and the rest. But then number two, it spawned now over 6,000 face-to-face local chapters. This was not at the blessing or from the <coughs> business plan of the Democratic Party. This was not even from the business plan or strategy document of Bernie Sanders or his organization, Our Revolution. This was a completely self-organizing, bottom-up, self-generated, collectively generated phenomenon. Even the four people who created that document had nothing to do with orchestrating and pulling this together. People got lit. They got lit at a moment when they were hungry for a how-to, right? And they said, not only is this how-to a really good how-to, and it's equipped us to go to town meetings and to make the kind of noise that we were talking about earlier at town meetings, but now it's actually given me a template for how I can apply pressure on my city council, on my state legislature, on my utilities commission, right? Now I'm using this stuff to meet with my neighbors on other stuff. And I think this is the moment we're in. It's the moment we're gonna be in for a good long time where people are organizing in these ways that were without permission, yeah, without a plan, which means it's gonna be messier. And it means some things are going to subside and disappear and they might look like they quote unquote failed. But in just the way that I described earlier that Occupy Wall Street didn't fail. People look at Occupy today, most people, and they say, oh, well, they didn't achieve anything. And certainly compared to the Tea Party, Occupy just disappeared. I beg to differ. Occupy, uh, Occupy Wall Street was like the tree in the forest that fell, but then became the nurse log for a bunch of other trees to grow. It's out of Occupy Wall Street and their language and framing of the 99 and the 1% that Bernie Sanders grew. It's out of that nurse log that the $15 minimum wage movement grew. It's out of that nurse log that something else still is going to grow, right? Reminds me of the, I believe, <coughs> apocryphal, but still too good to pass up story um, that uh, the Chinese premier, Zhou Enlai, uh, in the 1970s, um, after the US and China had uh, normalized relations, was asked at some press conference uh, um, about the revolutions of their times in the late 60s, and, uh, and, and Zhou Enlai was asked, what do you think of the French Revolution? And Zhou Enlai said, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out, I think there was something that was lost in translation, uh, but I kind of love that, right? <clears throat> so what do you think of the Tea Party? What do you think about Occupy Wall Street? What do you think about the Sanders movement? What do you think about the Trump movement? It's too soon to tell, but what we can tell is that old ways of insider elite establishment figures deciding for everybody else what their menu is gonna be, that, that's not, a, that, that's, that's not a, a, a line of work to get into right now. <clears throat> yes. Um, okay, and I, I can't quite see, but I would love to, um, I, all our uh, first few questioners have been men, and uh, I know that I'm not seeing them, and so if, if there is a, Woman in the audience who had a question. Um, let, let's go to the back. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. So inspiring. Really, really impressive. Um, I, I really understand the beginning of conversation with someone by taking ownership for my privilege and for places where you know my bad. But where I struggle sometimes is the next. That's such a great question again, and I'll, again, I'll slightly paraphrase for the camera, um, that she, the, the, the questioner was asking about, while understanding the importance of reaching out with empathy and humanization uh, and taking the initiative and leading by example to say, here's my piece of how we got to this bad way, 
so as to open up some heart space and let down, let the other person let their guard down, that while she understood this, <clears throat> it's often the case that that other person you're trying to connect with across lines of difference is saying or doing things that you just find objectionable, morally wrong, or racist, or you know, crossing a line that you can't abide. And what do you do with that? Um, I, 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 I'm not suggesting that you ought to abandon your moral sense. In fact, quite the opposite. And I think this is a time where everybody needs to sharpen their moral sense and know where their lines are um, and know what they will and won't do, um, not only in quote unquote normal politics, but in case of emergency, right? Lots and lots of my, I, I live in Seattle. And, you, and I didn't grow up there, but my daughter has grown up there. When you grow up in Seattle, you are taught from elementary school onward about the Japanese-American internment. And you're taught about the mechanics of it, and you're taught about how it worked, you're taught about the injustice of it, you're taught about the kind of acknowledgement and the reparations that followed. But what you're not really taught is how people, the day before Executive Order 9066 was issued by President Roosevelt, how people who were neighbors, classmates, coworkers of the Japanese American citizens who would the next day get interned, how on the day before they were unprepared to ask themselves, what would I do if something came down and my neighbor who I not only know and trust but perhaps indeed love and whose humanity I see fully is told they have 20 minutes to pack their stuff and they're going to a camp in Montana or in Utah or in Death Valley, right? What would I do? So I do think it's important for us to be sharpening our moral sense for these kinds of questions. But the thing that goes to the heart of what you're asking that I want to say more directly is this. I think that <clears throat> I, I do think there are some people who are truly, to use a word that got popular, <laughs> deplorable, whose views are so bigoted and benighted that it is difficult to abide engaging with them. But I think they are a tiny minority. And I think even those who hold, I think many of those who hold such views have more sides to them. And. I guess here's what I, feel, what I feel at the end of the day. I think that we're in a moment in American life where even if you feel like, man, why does it have to be me, the person who's already, you know, I'm a person of color, why do I have to be the one to say my bad? Why do I have to be the one to make someone else, you know, uh, a Rust Belt white person feel better about themselves? And why do I have to take and make the extra effort to be empathetic to them? And the answer is, because I'm a citizen of the United States. Suck it up. <laughs> Suck it up. Sometimes, if you want the republic to work and you want the union to mean something, you got to do something, even if it's not your turn. Right? And when it's my turn to crack that conversation open, what I want it to be about is not just my bad and what I did, but I want to have this conversation that I think our moment demands right now. And that a place like New Hampshire, again, is beautifully situated to show the rest of the country how to do this. And that is, let's talk about what we're scared of. Let's talk about what we're ashamed of. Because fear and shame are the motor forces of American politics in 2017, right? Across the board, I'm not just talking disaffected people who voted Trump. I'm talking Ferguson. I'm talking West Baltimore. I'm talking East Palo Alto. I'm talking South Seattle. Fear. Shame. Right? And we have an obligation right now to start having conversations about fear and shame and showing each other that it is possible to dig ourselves out of the kinds of politics that we have, which is an incredibly elaborate politics of acting out unacknowledged fear and shame. It is kabuki theater of kabuki theater of kabuki theater 
of unnamed, unacknowledged fear and shame and pain. Let's cut to the source. Let's go right to the mother load. Right? And let's do that in ways that aren't just about, well, use every tool possible. For some of you, that will be faith communities. For some of you, that will be political organizing. For some of you who are involved in humanities and the arts, it will be the absolute imagination, empathy opening power of art. Three weeks ago, I was in New York and I saw a play on Broadway called Sweat by Lynn Nottage, which just won the Pulitzer. Lynn Nottage, Lynn Nottage is an African-American playwright who spent two years of her life living in Reading, Pennsylvania, kind of the epicenter of that part of the Rust Belt. Two years, not as a kind of a social scientist with a field notebook looking at these strange natives. Two years living with, living among, going to the bars, going to the churches, going to the libraries, hanging out. <clears throat> Two years building bonds of trust and affection with everybody, black, white, Hispanic. Laid off, laid off recently, laid off since NAFTA. Hanging on, with, hanging on to a job, getting squeezed, resentful both of how they're getting squeezed and resentful of people who are trying to do labor organizing. She was there for all of it. She imbibed it for two years. And then she digested it, and she put what she digested into this play called Sweat. And I tell you what, from the opening scene of Sweat, my throat constricted. And by the end of that play, I was crying like a baby. Because that play did what art and humanities can do which is unlock the chambers of our heart in a way that gets to fear and shame and pain and, has a, and using a key that sometimes politics isn't available to politics, right? But whatever method you use, and it can be hybrids of all these methods, I invite all of you as citizens to think that our responsibilities today as citizens, and again, it's just circling back to the naturalization ceremony that we started out this day with, when I say citizen, I'm not talking about documentation status under the immigration and naturalization laws of the United States. I'm talking about that deeper ethical sense of, are you a member of the body, right? Because we all know there are lots of folks who have the documents but don't live like citizens. And there are lots of folks who lack the documents but do, right? And so when I say let us live like citizens, I mean let us Find that key and open up each other's hearts. Sometimes you'll do it in ways that say just that. Sometimes you'll do it in ways that are way less touchy-feely than that. But whatever means you use, let's share a commitment to the ends of rehumanizing our politics and making possible that establishment of those bonds that make us free. Um, I'm so, so honored to have been uh, with you tonight, and I'll get a chance to continue this conversation, I know, because um, our, uh, we've uh, set up a table outside uh, where they are selling uh, my new book, uh, You're More Powerful Than You Think, and I'll be happy to sign copies uh, for anybody who'd like to, to get one and continue the conversation uh, there if you'll promise to listen in to my nearly lost voice. Uh, <laughs> thank you.